virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody. Hands on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today. Ah, yes, back in the saddle, learning apologetics, defending, sharing the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. And uh, man, it's it's always uh, shot in the arm for me. I I look forward to this show every day because uh, I, there's just nothing more exciting. Nothing more wonderful than just learning more reasons, more ways that you can share uh, your belief in Christ with non-believers. Help clear up misunderstanding with uh, non-believers and believers and uh, doing apologetics. It's just great because it helps you learn the faith and it helps others come to faith or perhaps remove those obstacles that maybe they're struggling with. And uh, so it's it really is a spiritual work of charity to uh, help correct people uh, when they get things wrong in uh, any way, and also inform them when they don't know things that they ought to. For example, do you ever think of uh, Christ's Sacred Heart? There's a devotion to Christ's Sacred Heart in the Catholic Church. Do you ever wonder why? And actually, there's a very profound theological reason for this devotion. And it has to do with the mystery of the Incarnation, how the divine person, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, when he assumed to himself human nature, that union of the divine nature to human nature in one divine person is most aptly expressed through devotion to Christ's sacred heart. And uh, But what's the history of this devotion? If it's deeply theologically rooted... Did the early Christians, is there precursors to, you know, the establishment of this devotion? Well, we're going to have our good friend William Albrecht join us. You know, patristicpillars.com's uh, purveyor. He's going to come on. We're going to talk about the Sacred Heart of Jesus in Christian history. So that's going to be fascinating, fascinating uh, discussion about that. And I think it's going to also you know, clarify lots of things that we do as Catholics that we know and love, but perhaps we don't really fully understand the history and that just make that devotion all the stronger. Um, but that's on the other side of the break on this side of the break, as always, we're going to do our finding the fallacy. Today's fallacy is the appeal to flattery, appeal to flattery. And also, as always, we're going to meet, Early church fathers, uh, you know, we gone through. Actually, yesterday was one of those one of those early church fathers that we have the name, we have a quote. Basically, that's pretty much it. Well, this today's early church father may not be a household name, but he actually was extremely influential in the fifth century, and he is Saint Caesar of Arles, Saint Caesar of Arles. So, uh, lots of great stuff on the stack for today but you know let's begin like we always do by welcoming everybody into the dojo beginning with all of you watching live stream on facebook and all the other platforms howdy ho everybody also welcome aboard all you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world you know either through our handy dandy phone app or our flagship website, which is virtualmostpowerfulradio.org, or all the other distribution centers that uh, the world headquarters there in California beams out across the globe. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you on board. Um, oh, by the way, speaking of virtualmostpowerfulradio.org, uh, you should uh, take a few moments to stop by the website and check out uh, what's going on with Virgin Most Powerful Radio because we have yet another uh, stellar conference on tap. 
And you could get information on it. It's called Sex and Honor Conference. It's going to be in August. And all you have to do is just jump on virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And by doing so, uh, you'll see the banner pop up and click on the banner. You'll get all the info for that upcoming conference. I'll give you some more deets later on as that date approaches. But nevertheless, um, check it out. Uh, <laughs> you know, we were talking yesterday uh about the St. Joseph and the meaning of men, you know, something that is just getting totally erased in our culture, in Western culture. And uh, so this is sexuality, the dignity of man and woman, uh, the roles of man and woman. Uh, we need to be armed in this area. This is not a typical apologetic area that if you get an apologetics textbook, you know, it, they won't typically have a section on things like that but it's one of those areas that we all need to be able to give some good firm answers good advice uh, to help people who are struggling against uh, this horrible culture that we live in so uh anyway and that conference by the way fits the bill so let's see if you have a question for william you can always give us call 888-526-2151 or 888- when, once again, 888-526-2151. Or you can send me an email if you'd rather uh, chat that way. I'd love to hear from you. The official Dojo mailbox is questions at handsonapologetics.com. All right, so let's jump to the finding of the fallacy for today. Finding a fallacy is the appeal to flattery. It's a flat uh, fallacy in which a person uses flattery, excessive compliments, in an attempt to appeal to the audience's vanity to win support for their side. It is also known as apple polishing, wheel greasing, appeal to pride, appeal to vanity, and uh, so on and so forth. So it has a lot of AKAs. I don't think we really have to go into too much analysis on this. It is pretty straightforward. It's basically whenever an opponent butters up the audience by excessive compliments and so on in order to gain favor. Uh, that's when this fallacy is engaged. You know, I think this was a much more popular fallacy maybe a few decades ago. Uh, maybe it still goes on in social media. I personally don't think so, but uh, never. I wouldn't doubt if it did. So uh, you just need to be aware of whenever somebody, even uh, somebody that you enjoy and you you listen closely to what they say, if they are trying to butter you up and, you, you know, your antennas should go up that maybe this person is trying to use more than just the arguments and evidence. And they're trying to get me, win me to their side so that maybe I won't see the cracks in their arguments. So that's our finding the fallacy for today, the appeal to flattery. Let's go to meet our early church father for today, who is St. Caesar of Arles, uh, who was born sometime around A.D. 470 died around AD 542. Caesar of Arles uh, is undoubtedly one of the most influential Gaelic uh, uh, bishops of his time. Of course, he lived in modern day France, which was called Gaul. He was a monk in the monastery of Lorenz, and he held an important ep archiepiscopal see at Arles from 502 until his death 40 years later. Caesar was probably the most, uh, the greatest moral preacher in the Western Church between Augustine of Hippo and uh, Berthold of Regensburg, and was likewise renowned for his pastoral abilities. Not only did he personally escape the taint of semi-Pelagianism, which had infected so many of his countrymen and fellow monks, but he wrote vigorously against the heresy and presided over the Second Council of Orange in 52980 actually a very very important council for apologists because uh that is a, a council where they go into the idea of predestination and hammer out basically what is on God's side and what is on our side as far as salvation what can we do and what does God do uh so just remember second council of orange very important and this council condemned semi-pelagianism while upholding a modified form of augustinism the proceedings of origin are very short, were so, shortly received specific papal approval. 
And, in fact, uh, they're quoted in the Council of Trent. Especially renowned for his works of charity, Caesar himself lived in uh, perfect poverty while distributing to the poor and using, uh, using for the ransom of captives all such wealth that came to him. A Valuable Life of St. Caesar in two volumes was written by five of his friends and intimate acquaintances between the years 542 and 549. So his works largely come down to us by way of sermons. There is uh, never was a respectable edition, says Jurgen's faith of the early fathers, of the literary remains of St. Caesar until modern times. And uh, lately they've been collated into a collection. And uh, the sermons contain 238 items gleaned uh, largely from all sorts of different documents. Augustine especially uh, seems to contain an, um, some of his writings actually ended up with some of Augustine's sermons as well. And I also should note something very interesting about Caesar of Arles, because God providentially placed him in a location in Europe where as prelates were coming from all over Western Europe down to Italy uh, and back, you know, back and forth, they all more or less had to pass through his archdiocese. And so many of them passed through and heard his preaching. And his preachings on morals were so well received that what he began to do was have them down in writing so that they could take them to their individual diocese and have them read by their priest. And so in a way, you know, God providentially supplied Caesar in a time and place where he really was incredibly influential in saving the West from semi-Pelagianism and also the general uh, morality of Christianity in the West. And that's our early church father for today. St. Caesar of Arles. Coming up next, our good friend William Albrecht. We're going to be talking about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Stay tuned. Here's a great way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Do you have an old car you want to get rid of, motorcycle, RV, or boat? Simply call 855-500-7433, and when they sell that vehicle, a portion of that money comes right back to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. It's an easy way to do it. I want to thank you for it. Call 855-500-7433. God love you and your family. Mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Kowarski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody, to Hands On Apologetics. And we're going to talk about devotion to Christ's sacred heart. You know, what is the the roots of that in Christian history? And whenever you're talking about the early church, you're talking with a good friend of ours, William Albrecht. William is the purveyor of patristicpillars.com. He's also a co-host on the amazingly popular reasonandtheology.com. And he also has a fantastic uh, channel on YouTube, just titled William Albrecht, where, uh, of course, as you know, William has been in the trenches. He's had well over 50 live and moderated debates over a variety of issues. And without further ado, William Albrecht, how you doing, my friend? Gary, my dear friend, I am doing very well, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today to talk about a very, very important teaching that we have within our faith. Yes, indeed. You know, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is like it's part of the air that we breathe as Catholics, but I think most of us don't realize exactly how uh, profound it is in terms of doctrine. You know, it really has substantial theological roots, doesn't it? it? It really does, Gary. And what a really good point that you bring up, because if we don't properly understand what we're talking about, it can be misunderstood. And I do know that our Eastern brothers and sisters and even those within Protestantism tend to look down upon it because they don't understand what we're saying. And I love the definition given to us by the Catholic Encyclopedia. We read, devotion to the sacred heart is but a special form of devotion to Jesus. We shall know just what it is and what distinguishes it when we ascertain its object, its foundations and proper act. Devotion to the heart of Jesus alone as to a noble part of his divine body would not be devotion to the sacred heart as understood and approved by the church. That is the one thing we have got to really emphasize, Gary, that people don't realize when we talk about having devotion and, and dedicating the month of June to the sacred heart, we don't mean devotion to an organ alone. The church has always been clear. The, we must have. The same must also be said of devotion to the love of Jesus as detached from his heart of flesh, or else connected therewith by no other tie than that a word taken in the metaphorical sense. Hence, in the devotion, there are two elements, a sensible one, the heart of flesh, and a spiritual one, that which the heart of flesh recalls and represents. And that is why, Gary, when we talk about having a special devotion to Christ, it is so intertwined with Christology because it shows us we're giving true worship to Jesus. Why are we focusing on the heart? Well, we're going to unpack that today. And there's a very special reason why. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that definition, too, because it, especially for non-Christians or, or maybe, uh, like you said, Orthodox and others, it may seem odd. You know, why have devotion to a specific body part of Jesus? Why not have devotion to uh you know, it's a finger or, you know what I mean? But uh, but the reason the church focuses specifically on the sacred heart is because of that twofold aspect that it just said, you know, that uh, there's a sensible element of the heart of flesh and a spiritual element, namely Christ burning love for us. Gary, what a fantastic point that you make there. And indeed, <laughs> this is language very representative of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, some of the greatest messianic prophecies or foreshadowings speak of Christ as the arm of the Lord. We read of Christ as the root. We read of really this kind of language over and over, and we don't literally mean Christ is an arm. We're not literally going to. We can have devotion and talk about Christ as that incredible arm of the Lord, and all the while doing that, we're not focusing on an organ or a body part alone. We're talking about the whole person of Jesus Christ. That is why, as you know very well, being German, I love Ludwig Ott. And Ludwig Ott, great Catholic theologian, is very clear. Adoration of the most sacred heart of Jesus is latruo, is latria, meaning it is worship. But it's not worship of a mere organ. He notes very clearly just as lat latria, which is that particular Latin word from the Greek latruo, which is worship due to God alone, 
is due to the whole human nature of Christ, so it is due to individual parts of his nature. We take the whole Christ. We don't detach one organ or one body part and worship that disconnected from the rest of Christ. That is not how Catholics do Christology. And as you know very well, Gary, when we talk about that sacred heart, we're talking about the incredible love that Christ poured out for us in his shed blood on the cross. Mm. Yes. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ludwig Ott as well. And again, you know, it's, it has that German precision, you know, <laughs> where he really yeah. does uh, focus in very precisely on, on the nature. So uh, the idea that we can give Latria worship to uh, Christ's humanity as a whole also means that you can do it to individual parts as well. Makes sure. sense to me. Yeah, it, it really does to me too, Gary. And I think, and really kind of to maybe toss, toss it at you what you think about this, but would you agree with me that perhaps, and I don't mean this for our Eastern brothers and sisters because they do have a proper Christology. Protestants do as well uh, for the, the better part. But usually you find people that would object to the true meaning behind this devotion because maybe they don't understand what we mean in terms of the hypostatic union. What are your thoughts on that? I, I have noted that that seems to be very common. Yeah, it, I, if anything, I think devotion to Christ's sacred heart is kind of offensive to our imagination. It's a lot easier for us to imagine heretical views of Christology, you know, that this divine nature was kind of like a ghost in the machine or this human nature, you know, or something like that. Where it's like, no, uh, the divine nature, uh, the divine person assumed to himself, the, uh, you know, our whole human nature. And so that means that every single part, every, every, uh, every bit of Christ's true humanity is divinized. You know, it, it participates in that uh, union with the divine nature. And uh, I think uh, focusing in on sacred heart is kind of scandalous to our imagination. What do you think, yeah. William? I totally agree with you. And, I, and you know, I kind of get the idea that maybe Pope Pius VI might have felt that kind of perhaps um, pressing issue in the minds of some people, which is why he was very clear when he noted to the faithful that the heart of Christ is not separated or dissolved from the Godhead, but rather, as he says, but rather adored as the heart of the person of the word, with which it is, and this, these are the perfect great words, with which it is inseparably united. I think that is the one point we really have to focus on, Gary. And I think when we look, as we will, when we begin to unveil passages from the Old Testament, looking at the New Testament, looking at the fathers, we finally realize, okay, this is what is meant. This is why special emphasis is given to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in a completely different way, of course, because Mary is the greatest creation uh, of our Lord. But a very special way do we give devotion to the Sacred Heart of Christ, because that is different, because in that sense, we give the proper form of veneration. We give the proper form, which is adoration, which is worship. As you know very well, Gary, um, worship is due to Christ, veneration due to the saints, and the highest form of veneration due to the Mother of Christ— but when, when people hear of these um, venerations, these, um, these, these kind of uh, celebrations that we have, they kind of think, well, Catholics celebrate everything. What are they talking about here? Is this just another thing that is a kind of fanciful tradition? And I guess from the outside looking in, Gary, maybe it can be confusing to certain people. But when we unpack everything, we find that this is properly done by those within the apostolic Christian fold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you're right, William. I mean, there is this kind of misconception out there by you know many non-Catholics, usually anti-Catholics, that yeah. somehow Catholics got bored with worshiping the true God, and now they're coming up with all these innovations in that to uh, spend their time on with. But, but like you said, though, I mean, this is really to the very heart, if you excuse the, the pun, <laughs> of the incarnation, the hypostatic union, and, and that, I mean th that yeah, is correct. Ahead. Yeah, no, no. I was gonna, I was just gonna piggyback off of what you said. That's a great point, and and um, great pun because your point that this really gets to the heart of the issue. You stop and think about it. 
It is the Catholic Church from time immemorial through councils, local, ecumenical, through debates, through really to dying for the faith that Catholic Church has stood up for proper and true Christology. The church is not going to all of a sudden abandon that proper Christology and then begin to worship an organ alone. We need to realize what is really being said in this spiritual language. And when we unveil it, we find it to be very biblically based. Very good. So so what was the purpose? Was, was there a heresy or was there uh, something that the, the, the church needed to emphasize when it uh, uh, approved this devotion, this Christ's sacred heart? To be quite honest with you, Gary, it would be very difficult to pinpoint exactly what, but we know that, well, it's easy to pinpoint that it is to combat a Christological heresy, but to pinpoint which one exactly is the difficult part, because some people point to, at the origin in the middle 200s, that heresy of Paul of Samosata, who was a forerunner of Arius, who would have not agreed with the teaching of the hypostatic union. But then you get to Arius and his heresy, even though he adopted and took from Paul of Samosata, indeed, he came from the very same region, we realize that his heresy was a, of a different flavor. And then on and on we go in church history, we stumble upon figures like um, uh, Nestorius and, you know, heretics over and over, Helvidius, um, uh, Bishop Bonasus. And these are figures who I bring up the names because all of these individuals attack the very heart, pun intended, and the core of Christology. And really to emphasize that we give Latria, Latruo, that worship that is due to our triune God alone is important to combat all of these heresies because it brings, it puts at its center, front and stage, proper Christology. Yeah, absolutely. And what a beautiful pairing with the, the sacred heart of Jesus with the immaculate heart of Mary, because like you said, you know, the, the sacred heart focuses in on that uh, hypostatic union. And of course, Mary is uh True Marian uh, doctrine and devotion is really a safeguard against Christological heresy. So it's really, you know, a one-two punch with if you have devotion to both of those. And, and Gary, you would know very well, as you have written a fantastic book on the Our Blessed Mother, on Mary, a book called Making Sense of Mary. Anybody out there that doesn't have it, you need to have that book in your library. That is a great book. You bring up a really good point, Gary, because in the early church, as you know very well, those that had a poor Mariology always had a poor Christology and vice versa. They, but they went hand in hand. You had a proper Mariology, you had a proper, proper Christology. Yeah, absolutely. Well, William, I hear the music, so we'll hit pause there. We're chatting with William Albrecht uh, on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It's Roots in Christian History. Stay tuned. More to come after the break. This is a Catechetical Minute from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just as the gestation of our first birth took place in water, so the water of baptism truly signifies that our birth in the divine life is given to us in the Holy Spirit. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 694. The most basic elements of human life are often the actual tools that God uses in our relationship with Him. Water is one such element God has used, from the flood, to the Red Sea, to the Jordan River. Father, you have made all things with this in mind. May we recognize these signs of your love, in creation. This has been a Catechetical Minute, from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we come to understand. According to St. Augustine, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. May God grant us a strong living faith in Him and His divine plan of salvation, 
and help us to believe so that we may understand. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. And we're chatting with William Albrecht about devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And William, yeah, thank you for your compliments on my merry book. I want to compliment you and Christian, uh, Father Christian Caps on not only your book on Mary, which is fantastic, but also your book on transubstantiation right here. Uh, yeah, folks, if you want a real meaty uh, investigation into the roots of Marian teaching and scripture and church history, you got to get that book because they uh, uncover a lot and uh, a lot of new discoveries. And speaking of scripture, William, is the uh, you know is there some sort of tie with the Sacred Heart of Jesus in Scripture? Not n- no doubt about it, uh, Gary. There really is, and we we look into the Old Testament and we realize as 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 I pointed out earlier, there are many areas where we read of the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord has been sent out, and, and really that kind of language is utilized quite often. But there are also many areas and instances in which God uses heart and applies it to himself. That is a very, very common uh, theme that you find. You find it in 1 Samuel 13, 14. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. I mean, really, we read it often. In, in fact, if you look at the whole context, it says, but now your kingdom will not continue the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him to be ruler over his people. In Jeremiah 3, we read, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. You know, really everywhere we look, Gary, in particular one that is so, so important, which is in Jeremiah 32, 41, we read, I will make an everlasting covenant. Look at how heart the very essence of heart is connected with the everlasting covenant of God. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, never to draw back from doing good to them. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them, and I will plant in them this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Right there we have, right there in the Greek, kardia, which as you know very well, Gary, it's a Greek word for heart. This is very, very important when we look at this kind of language, even if certain terms are used and utilized in a metaphorical manner, the tying of that eternal everlasting covenant with God's people is tied to the very essence of God, and the very essence of God is described as God's heart and soul. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's uh, exactly, it, we learn in New Testament revelation, God is love, right? Yeah. And yep. so, you know, what, you know, talking metaphorically, you know, love is centered in the heart. And yeah, this, that's a really interesting point, William, about, you know, how the inspired word of God focuses in on, you know, God's heart, God's faithfulness, God's love for Israel. Uh, so already, even in the Old Testament, it's already kind of laying the groundwork for, you know, this later devotion to the sacred heart. What a great, great point you made there, Gary. And, and really, the one thing that I like focusing on, as, as a very good book written by a, a fantastic author, Heart of the Redeemer, really points us to, and it says, these texts of the Old Testament, it's talking about, that refer to the heart of God, always deal with his relationship to man, and often communicate his will for them. That is the most important thing, Gary. And we, we one kind of objection we frequently then encounter is, well, you know, but you know, the Old Testament is referring to God, who's pure spirit, without heart or body. That, sure, that that's fine. But the correct way to reply to that is to point out that, sure, God is pure spirit, without heart or body. 
Many of these passages are metaphorical, but they still reflect the truth in the manner in which God communicates with his people. And once we arrive in the New Testament and our Lord and Savior comes incarnate, comes in the flesh, our Lord and Savior's heart is not metaphorical. It is a real, true, beating heart, pumping blood. He was definitely, truly human. He was a human being. He was a living person. And therefore, we can apply all of these statements we find in the Old Testament very well. We can apply them to Christ because Christ has now come in the flesh. Everything said of the heart of God in the Old Testament is very true of the heart of Christ, who is our incarnate Lord and Savior, our God in the flesh. So on the one hand, definitely metaphorical. On the other hand, we definitely give true latria, true worship to a real real person, not merely a metaphorical or or kind of a phantasm. Yeah. Oh, awesome point. Awesome point, because uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so even even though, uh, like you said, and that's a, actually several good points that, of course, God doesn't have a physical body. So in the Old Testament, the term heart refers to a relationship that God has with creation. But once God assumes his flesh in the incarnation, now this metaphorical uh, uh, relationship can be applied concretely to the incarnate Lord. That's a beautiful point, William. Yeah, no doubt, Gary. And really, that that is definitely the the heart and issue and the essence of what we're getting to is that everything that we're saying that we're looking at in the Old Testament is also very applicable once we arrive into the New Testament. Yeah. I mean, really, the, the idea of, well, we just think of Psalm 40, where it talks about how the Messiah is going to surrender, suffer, and immolate his heart for redemption. This is a, a prophecy. This is a messianic psalm. So definitely it applies to our Lord and Savior, where it says, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is, in, is within my heart. And again, this is quoted in Hebrews 10. And when it is quoted, we know exactly what is being talked about here. It is talking about the surrender, the suffering, the immolation of, of his heart for redemption and Notice how that is directly quoted in Hebrews 10, meaning we have a direct connection to that incredible work that Christ did on the cross, all of it connected to that true, true reality of the hypostatic union that we've been talking about. Yes, absolutely. And, and as you know, William, uh, New Testament often uses the Septuagint, this Greek translation. Yep. And, and you notice there in Hebrews, it, there is a slight difference between the Hebrew text that you just read and uh, yeah. what it recounts that it doesn't say you open my ear uh, or you open the ear. It's a body you prepare for me. Yep. That, that is a fantastic point. And, and really noting how, how the authors of the New Testament are hearkening to this Greek, the Greek translation, Psalm 22 in particular, very, very, uh, the language utilized here is representative of language you would hear Christ using in the Gospel of Matthew. Psalm 22 says, I am poured out like water. And all my born bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. This, as you know very well, gets fulfilled in John 19, 24, Matthew 27, 35. And that is why in Matthew 11, we can read Christ saying, Come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, even there in, uh, especially in, in uh, Psalm 22 and the suffering servant. Uh, so you have this suffering heart, this sacrificing heart uh, being applied to the Messiah, you know, the incarnate Lord yep. himself. So it, so once we move to the New Testament, it's funny how, you know, the sacred heart kind of jumps out in these texts, isn't it? It, it really does, Gary, and there, there really is no doubt at all. And as, as we go further, as we look at a little bit more uh, New Testament, then we look at the fathers, we realize that the kind of language that we are utilizing today is language that is very reminiscent of what is said in the Old Testament, what is said in the New Testament, 
and what the early church fathers said, and for a very particular reason, that reason being is that we believe in the hypostatic union, we believe in a properly disposed Christology, and when we talk about giving worship to the whole person of Christ and his special devotion to his outpouring love, we are not separating the human nature from the divine. We're not committing the heresy of saying Christ was fully God without a human nature or fully human without a divine nature. As you know very well, Gary, throughout church history, we have had heresies that have arisen and have made those unfortunate errors. And it is a great thing that Holy Mother Church has been there from the very beginning to stamp out heresy and to stand up for the biblical and the ancient historical truth. Yes, amen. And uh, yeah, thanks be to God for that because uh, uh, you know, there's there's a million errors, but there's only one truth. And uh, yeah. sticking to what was handed down from the beginning, you know, through the the Holy Spirit and, and the historic church, uh, you know, has kind of stopped us from getting bank, uh, you know, shipwrecked on <laughs> these yeah. errors, right? And yeah, no doubt. Restoring Christ, yeah, yeah, really, no, no doubt, Gary. And 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 um, I don't know if we have enough time to cover one more passage before the break. Uh, let's see. We got um, maybe a minute. Yeah, All right. Minute. Let's really read it real quick and maybe we can pick up if we get cut off. Philippians 1 8. So important, Gary. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ. What we have here that people may tend to really kind of overlook is the equivalent is employed in Ezekiel 11. That is the equivalent that is for cardia, for heart. For right there, even though we don't have that Greek word for heart of Christ, if you look at that particular Greek word, you look at Bauer, you look at Freiburg, Greek lexicon, Danker, Greek New Testament lexicon, that Greek word is very frequently rendered heart. It is rendered heart in Luke 178. We're directly being told here, we can literally say the heart of Christ Jesus, because that word, that particular Greek word for affection is frequently tied in for heart. What are we being told here? I yearn for you with all the heart, the affection, the outpouring love of Christ Jesus. Wow. Yeah, that's great. And uh, yeah, th that kind of shows how sometimes our English translations kind of fail us in a way, because we, we lose the nuances in the Greek. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a tie, -in, especially uh, with Ezekiel and so on. Uh, well, hey, uh, yeah, th let's hit pause there and then maybe we could jump to the early church fathers on the other side of the break. Definitely. We're yeah, we're chatting with William Albrecht, Master Apologist. Check out his stuff on patristicpillars.com. We're talking about the sacred heart of Jesus and looking at the biblical and historical roots of that devotion. More to come after the break. Stay tuned. man once said that evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Well, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind and has long climbed from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose this war, and in so doing lose this great way of freedom of ours, history will report with the greatest astonishment that those that had the most to lose did the least to prevent it from happening. Well, I think it's high time now that we ask ourselves if we still even know the freedoms that were intended for us by our founding fathers. Every generation of Americans needs to know that freedom exists, not to do what you like, but having the right to do what you ought. You weren't made to fit in, my brothers and sisters. You are born to stand out, set yourself apart from this corrupt generation. Be saints. God bless you. If you shop on Amazon.com, there's an easy way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just visit smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center under the desired charity. Now, when you log into your Amazon account and purchase products, 
a portion of it will automatically go to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio at no cost to you. Thanks in advance for supporting CRC and VMPR, and may God richly bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with William Albrecht about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And William uh, has done a fantastic job diving into the Old Testament roots, the New Testament roots. And William... You know, let's look at the patristics. That is your uh, bread and butter, my friend, because you've done so much work in patristics. Do we find any uh, other uh, patristic roots for this devotion? We sure do, Gary. And we find it quite early in Hippolytus of Rome, commentary on Daniel. And the incredible thing I want to point to people is that I want to point out is that really from a very early period on, the kind of language being utilized is language that is so similar to the kind of language we utilize in the modern day 2021 when talking about devotion to the Sacred Heart. Look at the incredible similarities. One in particular, Hippolytus of Rome tells us, the stream of the four waters flowing from Christ we see in the church. He is a stream of living waters. And he's preached by the four evangelists, talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Flowing over the whole earth, he sanctifies all who believe in him. This is what the prophet heralded, where the words, streams flow from his heart. So that's Hippolytus of Rome, writing at an extremely early period. But then there's another work that we were told is written at a very early period, Gary. It was preserved by Eusebius, who in his church history... It is entitled The Acts of the Martyrs of Lyons and Vienne. It's a fragmentary writing, and it's reported that a deacon named Sanctus said, and this is, I'm quoting him, he's talking about a vision he had of the glorified, bodily resurrected Christ. And indeed, when we talk about giving worship, that is exactly who we're worshiping, the glorified, bodily resurrected Jesus Christ. He says, he himself remained unbending and unyielding, strong in his confession of faith, refreshed and strengthened by the heavenly spring of living water that comes forth from the heart of Christ. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. And, yeah. you know, when you think about the this living spring of water that comes forth from the heart of Christ, I know immediately you think of the, the crucifixion, right? Where from yeah. the side of Jesus, blood and water fell, flowed. But, you know, here he's talking about the resurrected Christ, this outflowing of uh, living water of love. What a, what a great point you make there, Gary. You're, you're definitely correct. That is what we frequently think of. And uh, that would have definitely been what, what the incredible Justin Martyr. So notice how early we are. We're not even in the yeah. second century when we're, when we're looking at Justin the Martyr. When he's dialoguing with the Jew Trifo, he refers to the human body of Christ as a source of grace. He says, we Christians are the true Israel that springs from Christ, for we are drawn out of his heart as, as out of a rock. Isn't that incredible, Gary? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is amazing. Uh, again, you know, that heart language, you know, uh, yeah. very interesting language. And again, just a martyr. You're so right. hundred. Writing sometime around eighty one fifty. I mean, this is incredibly early testimony. It, it really is early, uh, Gary. And what we've got here is we. The, the incredible thing is we we're looking at fathers that were not only uh, acquainted with the Greek language; those that were Latin fathers. We've got Syriac fathers as well. We have fathers from every region of the church that showed 
the very same kind of language being utilized to speak about a properly a proper kind of Christology. Indeed, Eusebius says, Christ was never severe with the weak or showed harsh, harshness, even to the arrogant and the proud. His heart always showed itself full of sweetness toward all men without exception. So Eusebius is utilizing the, the kindness, the charity, the love that emanates from Christ. He's using heart to refer to the very person of Christ and that loving kindness that emanates from him. Yeah. So Sacred Heart, devotion to the Sacred Heart. It's funny, you know, Catholics are using biblical language and they're also using the same kind of language used in the early church from way back. I mean, to the very beginning, this focus on the Sacred Heart of Christ. Uh, very fascinating. I totally agree, Gary. And, and another figure who is very, um, very venerated within every kind of um, ancient apostolic Christian Christian branch you can think of is the great St. John Chrysostom, the golden mouth one, as he is called. Yep. He tells us in his uh, To the Romans, this heart, talking about Christ, is higher than the heavens, greater than the earth, more splendid than pure light, more burning than fire. We can affirm with safety that the heart of Paul was as the heart of Christ. So in the beginning, he's talking about Paul and talking about how pure it was, and then says, the heart of Paul was as the heart of Christ. What is he doing? He's drawing a parallelism. That pure heart that a saint can only attain once they are in the heavenly presence of all the angels and the saints. How can you attain that pure heart when you're in heaven? But the parallelism being made is to the pure heart of Christ. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, William, do you think that has some sort of connection with uh, that a verse you quoted from Philippians? I do. I really do, Gary, because I, I looked and I examined the Greek. The Greek is right on point. I think St. Chrysostom, when he's talking about the Romans, he's then also talking about that passage in Philippians, because that would be the only other area where we have that real clear connection being made. But there's really no doubt that St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians, is definitely talking about that affection, that love that emanates from the heart as that particular Greek word is utilized multiple places. And again, for people wondering, don't just take our word from it for it. We've shown you Greek scholars. We've shown you lexicons and dictionaries that aren't just run-of-the-mill lexicons or dictionaries, but these are considered standards for anybody that delves into the Greek language. And we can see... When we look at that, and they're not written by Catholics, by the way, or compiled by Catholics. When we look at them, the very basis for our faith is biblically based and historically based as well. Yeah, yeah, very good. So you have fathers from uh, the East and West all focusing on Christ's sacred heart. Uh, well, why don't we continue uh, working through history? I love looking at the venerable bead. I mean, what, what a great... Um, He's a little bit later in church history, but he's still considered uh, uh, one of the greatest church writers, church fathers, in the sense that he was a master of typology. A ma he also wrote an ecclesiastical history, by the way, a, a fantastic writer. He tells us, thou hast wounded my heart, my sister, my spouse. This word is to be taken simply, for by mentioning the wounded heart, it expresses the greatness of Christ's love for his church. This is amazing, really, because we see all throughout history how the utilization of that term heart is utilized in many different manners, but all of it comes right back to our Lord and Savior. And here it's being used for the greatness of Christ's emanating love for his body, for his church. Yeah, yeah, and and it's bridal love too. You know, it's a yeah. love in marriage, and uh, yeah. you know what do spouses give each other on Valentine's Day? They give them hearts. You know, so yeah, that's uh, yeah, really cool uh, verse. And again, venerable bead, I think, is kind of uh, underappreciated by people. Uh, yeah. It's important, it's insight, especially his history. No, no doubt, really, without a doubt, Gary, he's such an important figure, and. On that very same note, I, I want to point people to another very important work. Seems to be overlooked, but it's from a medieval German prayer book. 
from the 1100s. And what incredible words we have here by looking at the year 1100. Remember, for our Eastern brothers and sisters, we're looking at the fact that this German prayer book was utilized at this particular time all over the church. It was a, it was a standard. This particular prayer book was considered a standard. And look at the language being utilized. It says, Veneration, Lord Christ, Son of God, for the dread with which your sacred heart was seized when you, Lord Christ, surrendered your holy limbs to suffering. And for your love and loyalty towards men, I beg you to comfort the pain of my heart as you comforted the pain of your disciples in the days of your resurrection. Isn't that incredible language, Gary? Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and this is from a medieval prayer book? Um, it is from a medieval prayer book. Interesting. You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a little late of a dating because I, I don't want people to come back and say, well, you know, some people dated to the 1100s. There are some that dated to a little earlier, the 1000s, but the majority would probably fall in line with it being from the 1100s. Either which way, what we have seen here, Gary, we have seen a clear chain that goes from the very beginning, Old Testament, New Testament, early church fathers, very, very early writing period, all the way to the medieval era, which shows us that this devotion, this kind of particular language is not a modern day novelty, but can be traced right back to the Old Testament. Yes. Yeah, very good. Well, we have about um, two more minutes left. Maybe we should address some objections that are raised against this devotion. Great point, Gary. And one particular one is, is the Sacred Heart devotion Nestorian? Let us define what Nestorianism is. Nestorius rejected the doctrine of the Incarnation by denying the hypostatic union of human and divine natures in the one divine person of Jesus. This denial was characterized notably, and this is what the Catholic Encyclopedia says, by the rejection of the title Theotokos or Theotokos for the mother of Christ. He claimed Mary was the mother of Christ's human nature, but not the mother of God. And he concluded that only Jesus, the man, suffered and died on the cross. But Gary, as we've seen from the Old Testament, as we've seen from the New Testament, from the early fathers and the medieval era, everything about the devotion to the sacred heart of Christ is orthodox, tiny because we realize and we give true worship, not to a mere organ or to a separated nature or to a separated will, but to the full person, undivided person of Christ, not simply a body part. We don't separate Christ. And as we recognize the language of Holy Writ and the fathers, we recognize this as being ancient. Yeah, boy. Yeah, that's such a great point too. I wish we, I wish we had like an hour or more to unpack that. But you're right. This also involves the the human and divine will of Christ as well. Yeah. And and so in a way, it's we're venerating uh, the the human will that, of course, is united to the divine will through the incarnation. Definitely. Yeah. Well, William. Hey, I hear the music coming up. Where can people go to get your books and uh, your other material? They can find uh, both books on the EWTN store or on Amazon, and they can also find them on patristicpillars.com where they can find out everything that I'm working on there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Can't wait to be back. Had a great time. All right. William Albrecht, go to patristicpillars.com. Check out his stuff, folks. Great, great material. Man, the hour's done, but never fear. Terry and Jesse will soon be here with the Terry and Jesse Show. High Impact Catholic Talk. And thank you for listening, and God willing, we'll talk again tomorrow. Bye-bye, everyone.